Good morning, Vertical Church. How are you guys doing this morning? Good. Why don't you find your seats? As they're enjoying the, uh, the sunshine and not the chill like we've had the past couple of weeks. Chuck's a fan. I saw that reaction. Why don't you go ahead and stand up with us? Romans 5, 6 through 8 says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Church, this is the word of the Lord to you this morning. Uh, that while we were weak, Christ died for us. While we, while we were still sinners, the Lord sent his son did not wait for us to move towards him. He did not wait for us to clean ourselves up. He saved us of his own volition and his grace and mercy. And it is because of this that we have great reason to praise this morning. It doesn't matter uh, whether we've had a good morning or a bad morning or a rough week or a great week. You have been saved, not at the cost of your own skin or your own effort, but by the blood of Christ. Amen. Oh my 
Oh 
King, but Jesus, Lord of all. Super, super grateful for those of you who are committed, who I get to see every week. Uh, know that you've been celebrated this week by your pastors. We had an elder meeting on Thursday, and we just were reflecting on how grateful we are for, for this church and, and those of you who are here week in and week out, even when it's cold and rainy and, you know, everything is going on. And, and those of you who, who we've been missing, know that you've been prayed for, know that we desire your, your friendship, your fellowship, we desire to be in relationship with you, and we want you to be here, uh, and we love you, and nothing keeping you away uh, is, is keeping us from loving you and praying for you and, and caring for you. Um, so we, we are thankful for every person who's here every week, um, and it, it's encouraging to my heart to see you. Uh, I wanted to share a couple of announcements. First, next week we're going to be moving inside permanently. Um, in anticipation of some colder weather, although today that feels far off. Um, with that move inside, we will be beginning to provide childcare for infants through pre-K, um, which is about five years old, if, if, if you're wondering about that. So we'll, we're going to have three classes, babies, toddlers, and pre-K, and um, we'll, Salem has graciously allowed us to use their classroom, so we'll have the check-in system as we have grown accustomed to in the past. So uh, if you have any questions, we'll have people on hand to sort of guide you through the process. But I did want to let you know that next week we'll be meeting inside and we'll have child care for those ages. Second, um, you may or may not know that throughout this entire process, we have been looking for a place to put down roots as a church, a, a building that we can Used to glorify God to try to accomplish the mission that he has given us as a church where we can gather as his people, we can equip each other as God's people, and then we can send each other out to live on mission for him. Um, and over the past several years while I've been meeting in the building, we've remained aware of what's out there and painfully aware that no one wanted us to be anywhere near their buildings. <laughs> and that has been a, a long process that we've been going through. And we're starting to see 
possibly some opportunities begin to open up. And so we wanted to come before you and ask for you to please be praying. Um, as we sort of sift through what's out there and we try to figure out where God intends for us to be as a church, we, we covet your prayers. We covet the prayers of God's people on our behalf as we try to make wise decisions and we try to interact with people who up until this point have wanted nothing to do with us. Um, and so, so we really we, we, we want to ask you to be praying. Um, and, and we'll update you as, as things become more concrete, hopefully. Um, and, and we just want to ask you to be patient and, and know that we are working toward that end and, and that we are hopeful that, that God is going to provide a place for us to be on a regular basis where we're not jumping in and out of buildings and trying to figure out where we're going to meet. And, and we are hopeful that God is going to provide that so that we can be more intentional and, and live on mission for Him and for that purpose alone. Cool? Okay, Pastor Josh is going to come up and preach for us. Well, good morning, everybody. It's uh, good to see you, as always. I'm excited uh, because today is a bit of a, a special, kind of monumental day for us. Uh, because today we're finally going to wrap up our series we've been in for about four months on the book of of Ecclesiastes. And so for those of you who have been with us since we kind of began uh, this study, and what is one of one of the most difficult books, I think, in the Bible, congratulations. Uh, you made it, and uh, we're almost at the end here today. And for those who are kind of maybe late to the game, uh, don't stress it, uh, because you came on a good week. Uh, for today, the, the editor and narrator of the book of Ecclesiastes is going to summarize a lot of what the preacher has said, and he's going to He's going to distill it down and kind of give us the big idea, or the main point that we should all walk away with after studying uh, this book. And so you find that in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, and we're going to pick up in verse 9 and finish it out uh, today. And I know uh, you guys just got seated, but I'm going to ask you to stand one more time with me as we uh, read this together. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, beginning in verse 9, says this. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote the words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man, and for God will bring every deed into judgment, every secret thing, whether good or evil. This is God's word. May we see it. Well, uh, fun fact about me, if you don't know, I love books. Uh, I do, whether it's fiction, nonfiction, I just love to read. And perhaps that makes me uh, a bit of a nerd, uh, but it's the truth. I like big books, and I cannot lie. Um, in fact, few things excite me more than getting that notification on Amazon, you know, that uh, there's a delivery to the house and I got some books waiting on me. I mean, it's like Christmas and I just can't wait to get home and tear open that package and, and take out those books and retire to the couch or to the back deck, which is my favorite spot, and begin thumbing through uh, the pages. Now, granted, it wasn't always this way. Uh, for most of my life, I, I hate it. I despise uh, reading. But over the years, my love for, for learning and reading has, has really grown. However, uh, as you know, there, there are a lot of books out there, and so sometimes it can be difficult to kind of determine, okay, what's, what should I read, and what's worth the time and investment. And so one of, one of the things that I'll often do before I pick up a, a new book is I'll check out a couple book reviews. Uh, and in doing so, what I'm looking for is, okay, what is this book about? You know, what's the basic premise or the, the main argument that the person is trying to make? And two, why should I read it? Like, what's so special or significant about this particular book that's going to make it worth my time? And this can be a helpful way of determining uh, whether something is worth checking out or, or not. 
And in a very similar way, today's passage functions a lot like that. In fact, you could say that this is God's five-star review of the book of Ecclesiastes. And in this review, the editor, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is going to tell us what this book is all about and why we should read it. Now, other today we're going to see why this old book, written almost 3,000 years ago, is something that we should give our attention to, that we should listen to, that we should obey. And he's going to break it all down and he's going to hit us with the bottom line. Like, what's the, the main point? What's the big idea, the one thing that we should walk away with after hearing all that the preacher has said for the past 12 chapters? And so first, let's look at the value of this book. Why should we pay attention to the book of Ecclesiastes. Let me highlight just a couple reasons that this reviewer gives. Number one is this. We should pay attention to the book of Ecclesiastes because the preacher's words are true. Look again what he says in verse 9. He says, Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. The preacher sought to find words of delight and uprightly he wrote the words of truth. And so here we see that the book wasn't just thrown together at random, but it was carefully arranged and constructed with logical clarity and literary artistry. In fact, uh, one American writer wrote that the book of Ecclesiastes is the, the highest flower of poetry and the greatest single piece of writing that he has ever read. Heck, even those who don't agree with the preacher, don't like the Bible, uh, grow to appreciate many of the things that are said within this book. However, this book wasn't just written clearly and stylistically so we could stand back and ooh and awe and, and how Solomon put this whole thing together. But even more, it was written truthfully. When Solomon told us the truth about God and about ourselves and about life under the sun. And to be sure, this wasn't just true for Solomon. And it's not just a book that's true for Christians, but it's true for all people. And I realize that that might be a hard pill to swallow, especially in a day and age when it's, it's really you know, popular to, to view all truth as entirely subjective. And it's really common to hear people say, well, you know, that might be true for you, but that's not true for me. That might be your truth, but that's not my truth. And while that might sound very charitable and open-minded on the surface... It's actually just quite ridiculous. The truth, by very definition, is not subjective to our, to our circumstances, our own personal opinions or, or ideas. Just to give you an easy example of this, what if I told you that I am six foot eight? And I believed it, sincerely. That's my perspective. Would that at all make me six foot eight? No, I mean, it might be hard for you to say that, but no, it doesn't mean that I'm six foot. The truth is, I'm two inches shy of Hobbit, okay? I'm about five, seven, five, five, eight. It doesn't matter how I feel about it. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. It doesn't matter if I'm saying that here, outside the pavilion in Goochland or in the jungles of West Africa. It does not change the truth. Either I'm six, eight, or I'm not. Right? And if, if we have any question about this, we can just kind of pull out the tape measure and, and see. But it can't be true for me and not true for you. Either it is true or it isn't. And here's what God just said about the book of Ecclesiastes. He said these words that we have been studying over the past four months, that they are true. Now you might not like what the preacher has to say. But to be sure, they are the words of truth. And this truth serves a good purpose in our lives, which leads to the second reason why we should pay attention to the book of Ecclesiastes, and that is because the preacher's words are helpful. He says in verse 11, he says, And the words of the wise are like goats, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. Now, what is a goat? After all, it's not a word that we hear used a lot. You know, in fact, if you haven't been discussing the book of Ecclesiastes, I doubt that this word has ever come up in conversation. And so, so what is it? Well, to put simply, a goat is, is a long wooden stick with a sharp point that a shepherd or farmer would use to poke and prod livestock to move in the right direction. It's like the ancient equivalent of a cattle prod. 
And in using this tool, the farmer, the shepherd, is not trying to kill the animal. He's not trying to hurt or abuse the animal. But he is trying to cause just enough discomfort to move that stubborn beast in the right direction. And what Solomon is saying is that Solomon's words here are, are a lot like that. See, God doesn't want us to waste our lives and repeat Solomon's same mistakes. And so he uses words that sting and poke and prod us and convict us and force us to feel the full weight of the fleeting nature of life. So that we might avoid a life of vanity and folly and live a life that really matters. Find a life of meaning and joy and purpose for the few days that we have. In addition, he also says that the preacher's words are like nails that are firmly fixed. And as I thought about uh, this image, I was reminded of a situation that I've had at my house. I have a wooden deck on the back of my house, uh, but it's about 30 years old. And over time, those nails can, can get loose and begin to rise up, and, and the boards are not as stable as they, they used to be. And so every once in a while, i got to, I got to walk out there with a hammer... And I gotta nail those 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 nails back into the wood so that we have a stable foundation on which to sit and to walk around. Likewise, Solomon's words have a similar purpose in our lives. They're like nails that are driven into a block of wood that provide a stable place for us to stand and move about. In other words, the book of Ecclesiastes doesn't just help steer us in the right direction, but it provides a stable foundation on which we can build our lives. But perhaps the, the greatest reason why we should pay attention to the book of Ecclesiastes is, is this, number three, because the words of the preacher are divine. He says this, the end of verse 11 there, he said, And they, speaking of the preacher's words, are given by one shepherd. You may notice that shepherd there is capitalized in most English translations, and that's because this is a messianic title that is used almost exclusively in the Bible to refer to God Himself. In other words, these aren't just the words of a man. You are, when you read the book of Ecclesiastes, you are reading the very words of God. In a very real sense, you are hearing the voice of Christ Jesus, your shepherd, through the voice of the preacher. And, and this is why, a little pet peeve of mine, this is why I do not like those, those red letter editions of the Bible. You know what I'm talking about? Where all the, the words of Jesus are supposedly captured in red because I think they're at best inaccurate and at worst unhelpful. Because if you're asking which one of these words, which of these words come to me from the mouth of my Savior, the right answer is every single one of them. And so you might as well get your red highlighter out and highlight every daggone word in this book because all of them come to us from one and the same shepherd. Paul says all scripture is God breathed. And when that word all there definitely includes this small, strange, enigmatic book sandwiched in the middle of our Old Testament. These are not just the musings of a human teacher or philosopher. These are the very words of God Himself. This is part of God's divine revelation to us. So we should pay attention to them. And he says we should be beware of going beyond them. Verse 12, he says, My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. <laughs> Boy, is that true. In fact, you know that there are over a million books published every year in the United States alone? And that's not counting articles and blogs and publications and journals that are constantly being put before us. And listen, not all of them are bad. In fact, some of these resources are helpful and they are good. However, his point here is that none of them can do what this book can. And so he exhorts us, don't, don't set the collected sayings of your shepherd over here and go searching for wisdom in all these other places. Don't do it. But instead, build your life on the bedrock of Scripture. For Scripture is true, it is helpful, and it is divine. It is from God Himself. And so the question is, will we listen to God? Will we trust in God's wisdom when we trust in our own? Will we follow His ways or will we treat His words as just another opinion in a sea of endless voices? And my hope is that we would choose the former. 
After all, God is kind of smart. It kind of comes with the territory, you know, being God and knowing everything, seeing everything, creating and controlling everything. So we would be fools to diminish or ignore what He has said. And in case you missed it, here's what God has been trying to say to us through the book of Ecclesiastes. Here's, here's the big takeaway. You ready? Verse 13. This is the end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God and keep His commandments. Because you're looking for a life verse. You're looking for a sentence that's going to help you avoid a life of folly and vanity. It's that right there. Fear God and obey His commandments. Let's look at those one at a time. First, He calls us to fear God. And this is not the first time that we've seen this in the book of Ecclesiastes. In chapter 3, He tells us to fear God because His works are eternal. In chapter 5, He says, fear God because He demands holy worship. In chapter 7, He says, hey listen, you need to fear God because that's going to help you avoid both self-righteousness and licentiousness. In chapter 8, He says, you want things to go well for you, you need to fear the Lord. And then here again in chapter 12, He says, fear the Lord, for you'll one day stand before Him in judgment. So what does it mean to fear God? Or more specifically, what does it mean... For a believer who has been promised salvation from divine judgment to fear the God who judges. I mean, how do you make sense of the fact that Scripture calls us to both fear and find assurance in one and the same person? Because normally those two things don't they don't go together. If you fear someone, you're hoping that somebody else is going to come and help save you from that, that person. But over and over again in the scriptures, we are told to, to fear the one we hope in and to hope in the one we fear. And so what in the world does that mean? What does that even look like? Well, in his book, The Pleasures of God, John Piper provides an illustration that I think is really helpful. He says this, he says, suppose you are exploring an unknown glacier in North Greenland in the dead of winter. And just as you reach the steep cliff with a spectacular view of miles and miles of endless ice and mountains of snow, a terrible storm breaks in. And the wind is so strong that fear begins to rise in your heart. You worry that you might be blown off the edge of the cliff to your own destruction and die. But in the midst of the storm, you find a cleft in the ice where you can hide. And here you feel secure. But even though secure, the awesome might of the storm rages on. And you watch it with a kind of trembling and, and pleasure as it rushes over the mountain and across the distant glaciers. At first, there was fear this terrible storm and awesome terrain might claim your life. But then you found a refuge and gained a hope that you would be saved. But still, not everything in that feeling called fear vanished from your heart. Only the life-threatening part. There remained the trembling, the awe, the wonder, and the feeling that you would never want to tangle with such a storm or be the adversary of such a power. And so it is with God. Though as God has provided a refuge in His Son where there is salvation and security from the terrible storm of God's righteous and holy wrath. But that should never produce in us a sort of cavalier spirit or casual approach to Him. God is not a God to be taken lightly. He's not to be trifled with. He's not simply our buddy. In fact, I was reminded of that scene from... C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, where Mr. Beaver uh, tells Susan that Aslan, the ruler of Narnia, is actually a great lion. And this surprised Susan because she assumed that he was, he was just a man, that Aslan was kind of more like, more like her. And she said to Mr. Beaver, I shall feel rather nervous to meet a lion. And she asked Mr. Beaver, is Aslan safe? And Mr. Beaver said, safe. Who said anything about being safe? Of course he's not safe. But he's good. And you might add to that, and he's kind. And he's gracious to all those who fear his name. And so how do we maintain 
This proper view of God and a fear that causes us to run to God and not from Him. Well, I think Paul provides some really helpful insight here in Romans chapter 11, verse 22. Let me, let me give you a little bit of the context here. Paul is warning Gentile believers who have been grafted in to the family of faith, the, the olive tree, this, this true Israel by faith. He's warning them not to repeat the same mistakes of ethnic Israel, who in their arrogance and in their pride were broken off from the family of God. And he encouraged them instead to stand fast through faith, number one, and number two, to fear the Lord, lest they too be broken off. And then he tells them how. How do, we, how do we do that? How do we maintain this proper balance? He says, take note then of the kindness and the severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen, but kindness towards you, provided you continue in His kindness. And so how do we maintain a proper view of God and this humble fear that keeps us clinging to Christ? Well, Paul says we need to look at both the mercy of God and the wrath of God, the kindness of God and the severity of God. Because if we only look at one, we will end up with a distorted view of God that's going to lead us in the wrong direction. You see, some people only want to look at the kindness of God. And all they want to talk about is the love of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God. And those are amazing things, but they want to overlook or ignore the righteousness of God. The wrath of God, the holiness of God, the justice of God. And so consequently, God is reduced then to being viewed as a sort of cosmic teddy bear who has no real authority over our lives and shouldn't be taken that seriously. After all, Jesus is just your homeboy, right? And the result is no proper fear. No real repentance and remorse over our sin. No urgency for obedience. Why? Because God is just barning the dinosaur without the cool costume. However, on the flip side, there are those who, who want to only look at the severity of God. And they love to talk about God's bigness and His transcendence and His holiness and His hatred for sin. But they ignore or overlook His patience and His kindness and His unrelenting, unconditional, and transformative love for sinners like you and me. And so then the view of God becomes a sort of miserable, unappeasable deity who just can't wait to destroy everyone. And the result of this line of thinking is either despair, because you have a self-awareness to know that you will never meet God's holy standard, or false hope, because you buy into the delusion that your unrighteousness will suffice. However, both of these are damning errors. They're going to lead you to destroy, to destruction. They're, they're an inaccurate view of God as He is presented to us in the Bible. We must look at both the mercy of God and the wrath of God and let that drive us like a nail into His kindness. We must keep both of these in view. And perhaps the best way I know to do that is to look at the cross. For it's there that we see the full range of God's attributes, don't we? At the cross we see His righteousness displayed. We see His justice displayed. We see His wrath poured out. We see His holiness that cost the life of His only Son. And we see His patience and His humility and His mercy and His kindness for undeserving sinners like you and me. In fact, I love the way that John Brown is a 19th century pastor and theologian. I love the way he put it much more beautifully than I ever could. He said this, Nothing is so well fitted to put the fear of God, which will preserve men from offending Him, into the heart as an enlightened view of the cross of Christ. There shines spotless holiness, inflexible justice, incomprehensible wisdom, omnipotent power, and holy love. And none of these excellencies darken or eclipse the other, but every one of them rather gives a luster to the rest. They mingle their beams and shine with united eternal splendor. The just judge, the merciful father, the wise governor. It's nowhere does justice appear so awful, mercy so amiable, or wisdom so profound. And so, church, let us look again and again 
and again and again to the cross of Jesus where the kindness of God and the severity of God kissed And let that produce in us a proper fear of the Lord that drives us straight into His arms. We are to fear the Lord. Secondly, it says that we are exhorted to keep His commands. And really those two things go hand in hand, don't they? If you really fear the Lord, you will strive to obey Him. And we really don't have time to tease out all of God's commands and everything that He has asked of us during our time together. But thankfully, Jesus summed it up in the Gospels pretty well. He said, you want to know what the commands of God are? You can sum them all up this way. Love God with all you've got. And love your neighbor as yourself. For all the commandments of God can really fall under one of these two categories. It's that simple. It's not complex. Great, it's not easy. In fact, Only Jesus was the only one to ever do it perfectly. But it's not unclear, it's not ambiguous, it's pretty straightforward. And here the writer tells us why, gives us several reasons why we should fear the Lord and strive to walk in obedience to Him. First in verse 13 he says, For this is the whole duty of man. Now interestingly, the word for duty there, there's no word there in the Hebrew Uh, That's simply a word that's supplied by the translators to make it more readable uh, in English. But more literally it reads, for this is the whole of man. Now, duty may may certainly be implied, and I think that it is. I think it's even more broader than that. It's as if he's saying, this is the sum of your existence. This is your purpose. This is the meaningful life. So if you want wholeness, you want to know where completeness and meaning and joy is found, is found in fearing God and walking in obedience to His commands. We must have a proper fear of God. We must recover that. We must stop running against the grain of God's good design for our lives. That's not the only reason He gives. In verse 14, He also says, For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing whether good or evil. See, whether we like it or not, one day you and I will stand before the lion. We will stand before the holy God and give an account for ourselves and the lives that we have lived under the sun. And on that day, every thought and every action will be exposed to the light of God's judgment. And that reality should remove in us all indifference towards the Lord and should cause us to stand in fear. But not a fear that leads us away from Him who is our only hope, but a fear that causes us to run to Him, crying out in the arms of faith, hide me in the cleft of the rock that is Christ, lest I die. For apart from Him, who can stand before a holy God But the good news of the gospel is that in Him, we can stand with confidence on the day of judgment. Not because of what we have done, but because the work of Jesus Christ was sufficient to cover all of our sins and restore us to right relationship with the Father. And secondly, this reality of judgment should cause us, remove in us any indifference towards His commands. You see, if there is no God... If there is no judge, if this life under the sun is is all that there is, then nothing you do matters. Do whatever you want. Who cares how that impacts anybody else? Do what makes you feel good. Do what you want to do. However, if there is a God, and there is a judge, and this life is not all that there is, then everything you do matters. For it carries eternal significance. Like one commentator said, that the final message of Ecclesiastes is not that nothing matters, but that everything does. Because there is a God. There is life beyond the sun. So what you do with your time matters. What you do with your money matters. How you use God's gifts matters. What you do with your body matters. What you say matters. How you treat the lost and those in need matters. Because even if nobody else sees and nobody else cares, God sees 
And his opinion is the only one that counts anyways. And even if there is nothing under the sun to be gained by walking in obedience to him, Jesus promises eternal reward for those who trust him and those who obey him. And so by God's grace and strength, may we heed the words of our shepherd and fear the Lord and walk in obedience to his commands. For this is the meaning of life. This is the way of wisdom. This is what glorifies God in church. This is the point of Ecclesiastes. Amen? Pastor Dave, would you come and lead us in response? Hebrews 10, starting in verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Each week here, after we hear the the Word of God proclaimed. We've built in a time of response. And it's where we do just what, what this passage says. We draw near to God by remembering that because of His broken body, Jesus' broken body and spilled blood on our behalf, we can come to God with full assurance. And the way we do that is by celebrating the Lord's Supper together. And so we're going to do that here in a moment. But first, like every week, we want to give you a moment just to, to take with the Lord. A moment of reflection. Because we have the freedom to reflect on this week and, and even this morning. Reflect on, on our successes and failures. And repent where we need to repent. And praise God for the successes that we've had. Because of Jesus Christ. And so I want to give you a moment now to just take a time and reflect on your week. Reflect on the words that were said this morning. And then we're going to celebrate together with the Lord's Supper. Take a moment. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, so thankful of your grace and mercy that you poured out on all of us through the cross, Lord. through your Son, Jesus Christ, who lived a life that we could not live, perfect, righteous before you, Lord God, and died the death that we all deserve for our rebellion. So, Father, even now we come before you and we, 
we lay our failures and our sin and our rebellion at your feet, the feet of the cross, Lord God. Father, we thank you for the successes we've had this week, for the times we were able to walk in wisdom, because we know that it is your Holy Spirit at work inside of us that empowers us to do so. Father, we thank you for the preacher this morning, for his wisdom that he's imparted on us, that he left for us, Lord, through your Holy Spirit at work in him. Father, help us to be a people that, that have a proper fear of you, and yet a people who know that we have full assurance in Jesus Christ. And Father, let this wisdom, this knowledge be played out in front of all those around us that we might make an impact where we are for your glory. Lord, we celebrate you now. We thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. This is his body that was broken for you. Take the break. This is His blood that was poured out to cleanse us for our sins. Take the cup. Now will you all stand with us as we praise the Lord. Yes, 